This is my colleague from the uh, Department of Music, Bertolt Hockner, uh, who is here with me tonight. I told you he'd be coming, and he's now arrived. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, what I would like to do uh, is what I, to start things off, is to uh, basically repeat what I've done in the past, which is to function as group secretary for the first few minutes, and to get a sense of what you would all like to uh, make sure we get around to. Um, in a discussion of this film. Um, this is especially, um, this is, an, I think, a, <coughs> especially, if they use the word puzzling, I, I used that a couple of times in the introduction, um, I think it is puzzling. I mean, I don't think for a moment, I don't believe for a moment that I have, you know, an interpretation behind my back where I've got everything and all the points connected and voila, there it is. Um, it's not that kind of a film. Um, it resists that kind of point-to-point uh, -point interpretation, all right? Um, that being said, um, I think it's a very uh, provocative film in a lot of ways, and uh, since this is, a, you know, I've seen it a few times, but I've never thought it before, uh, I have no sense at all of what other people think about it. And so that's why I'd like to uh, throw it open, and then uh, Berthold and I will uh, give our, put our trade reps and um, add our two cents. So please, let me start us off. Things that you uh, found interesting, uh, things that you'd like to talk about, things you found uh, worthy of discussion. Susan. I'm happy to jump in. It is gorgeous, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I'd like to play devil's advocate for a minute and say that we can understand it on one level, and I'm sure there's much more. It's fatal attraction underwater. <laughs> it's, it's romantic obsession and the lengths to which people will go. Um, certainly it's not a logical thing. It's much more about romance and obsession. But the thing I wonder about is why does it focus so much on Eastern West Berlin? Why this whole notion of split and, and differences and architecture? I don't know. I mean, that's where I'm puzzled. The rest of it seems fine, but that's what I don't get. Yeah, I think that's a great way to get it started, all right? Because so, uh, the film includes many sequences in that room with the scale models, all right? And um, you can say, well, um, you know, we have her, that great point of view shot where she's looking down at the church and then she sees her life in that church. And then we get something very similar when Christoph, uh, at the, toward the end of the film, looks at the landscape and has the flashback and it's superimposed over it. And so, it is that you could say, okay, it's a landscape of desire. All right, and you know, one could read the film as a love story in that way, where desire, in effect, pervades everything. On the other hand, there's an awful lot of talk about uh, the history of urban urban planning in Berlin, and that's one of the things that I think is most perplexing and also challenging. Uh, and this, every time I see it, I keep kind of chewing on that, and I don't really have a great answer for that, but I think they're absolutely right. It's one of those tensions within the film. I mean, Yes, it's a love story, but then what's all this other stuff doing there? Yeah, Bill. I really enjoyed it as well. Um, and I, I actually see more continuities uh, with his other work than differences because it seems to me to pick up right where Phoenix leaves off. And it's the mm -hmm. question of the, whether love is eternal, whether it lasts, whether it's ephemeral, whether it's desire as you speak of, or whether it's love in some more ethereal sense. Um, and, and so, it's much more connected, and, and if you think of it in those terms, then you can think of the, all the talk about the history of Berlin as uh, really accentuating that, because the, it's thrown against this, this relief of those decades, if not a century, of, of human warfare, and, and you know, the city's destroyed only, you know, 80, 90 percent in the World War II. Uh, that would be the counterpart to the Holocaust in Phoenix, right? You know, what does does love mean? And then I, I, one other thing that just comes to mind, I don't know if it's others felt the same way, but the main character is not Johannes, but the other the fellow she loves. Uh, Christoph. Christoph, of Christoph. course. Mm -hmm. He's, to my mind, he's a Franz Bieberkopf figure uh, from Berlin Alexanderplatz, which mm -hmm. fits very nicely, I think, with the background. Uh, but anyway, just a few thoughts. Thanks. And it's Franz Rogowski. His first name is Franz Rogowski. Of course, Paul, yeah, yeah, Franz, Franz Bieberkopf. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Uh, he's, a, he's a brilliant actor who appears in one of Haneke's most recent movies. Mm. And I think I saw a lot of Michael Haneke in this one, especially The Aquarium. 
because if you remember the seventh continent, which is, uh, I believe, Haneke's first feature, right? There's a famous, very famous scene of the explosion of the aquarium. And it's kind of like also, like this one, kind of like a glaciation film, right? Since in Haneke, uh, there's this glaciation trilogy. And when you mentioned the, the, the trilogy here uh, in the introduction, I thought immediately, because I had not seen this one, I thought immediately about, uh, about Haneke's trilogy, right? And I think there are many references to Haneke here that I saw. I don't know if it's pertinent, I don't know if it's intentional, but I know that Petzold watches Haneke's movies, right? And so uh, when we think about this aspect, and I think I, it goes back to the reflection on Berlin, I think one of the key points, and probably you noticed, Bill, one of the key points, uh, it's even, I think, one of those moments when there's a plot within the story of Berlin as it's told here, right? Uh, even like almost in the swamp, right, that this city is all about because this is a city of sand and swamp, right? Uh, it's the, the, the big controversy over the Stadtschloss, Stadt the, the, rebuilt, the rebuilding of the Stadtschloss, replacing the Palast der Republik from the, the German Democrat, Democratic Republic. And I think this, this is the core, I believe, of my, I mean, at, at least it's my reading of the map of Berlin here that's at stake on how you know, history tends to make things disappear in the swamp and revive things. And the, the fact that the film is haunted, there are haunted figures that keep coming back in the film. And that's, of course, the figure of the, of the person who disappears in the lake. But I think it really connects the, the theme, like what Susan is, is uh, questioning. I'm, I mean, I'm not answering questions here, but I'm raising questions. Because, because the returning of the, I don't know if it's the ghost of Un, uh, Undine or, 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 or if, it's, if it's her, but it's also the theme, if we think about it, of the replacement of the, Stadt, of the, the rebuilt of the Stadtschloss from the 18th century back in the 21st century after erasing right, the Palace de République from the GDR. That's just one possible reading of this tension in the film. Yeah, I want to add a bit to that. I think the core concept of this movie is liquidity or fluidity. Yes. That's what the history of Berlin shows by yes. built and rebuilt the same palace. And I also noticed how things often broke, things often break in this movie. And they are constantly rebuilt, like the, the hero said, yeah. uh, Christoph said, oh, I can re I'm a great painter. And like how the, they, they're, I mean, they met because of a break, a break of, I mean, an old relationship and the, and the water tank. And, and also the, the figure, the diver, the diver figure is also broke. And, it seems that yes. Undine is great at repairing it. She, re she repaired it remarkably well. And that's what she did in the end of the film. She also mm. repaired, she also repaired Christoph by killing, by brought right. life from others remarkably well. And life here is also transferable, it's also liquid. And mm. I, I also can't help Noticing that how many trains are yeah. appearing in this yeah. film, it's always yeah. moving, shifting, yeah. meeting. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to add that I found it very interesting that the film used that same piano piece throughout the entirety of the film. And I guess I just uh, was curious as to the significance of this piano piece or in why the director might want to use this piece throughout its entirety. Hello? OK. Um, uh, this is a fascinating discussion. Uh, perhaps I can circle back to some of the other questions first to, to, uh, to respond to your uh, question. It seems to me that um, 
there is uh, an interesting moment of intertextuality there, perhaps. Um, uh, that, that the use of Berlin and of that model and the city topography and archaeology of the city um, is a kind of national unconscious that's mm -hmm. located in, in a city that's associated with the worst and the best. So yeah. if it's a utopian city right now, uh, it's a destin destiny for everybody who wants to be um, escape, if you want, all the woes of the world. Uh, uh, at the same time, it, it, it's the place of, of that kind of division between East and West and uh, the trauma of uh, uh, the Third Reich and so on and so on. So um, it seems to me that it represents a kind of wound of sorts and, um, and that the film is on some level about uh, that kind of he healing. It's a, it's a national, a cultural unconscious <coughs> and, um, and uh, the love story is the, the mythical aspect of the love story that, that um, Hyman, that transition between the real and the magic uh, through water, that passing through, is, is one way of thinking about the healing of the wound. Because it's, it's a fatal attraction, but uh, Christoph doesn't die. He lives, and mm -hmm. there's a baby, and you know, the bad guy gets, uh, dies in a kind of nice and spectacular manner. Um, reminds me of Sunset Boulevard. Um, but to come back to the music, um, one interesting thing at the end is that he has this figure of um, uh, of the, the the figurine of the of the diver, and it's intact. And um, this is, of course, one of the things that these kinds of films do. And I'm thinking of Solaris which is uh, Tarkovsky, um, and Hari comes back, she committed suicide, um, the astronaut is at the station, is haunted by her memories, she comes alive, um, and there's this scene where they watch this film, uh, Tarkovsky, 1972, mm -hmm. um, Solaris, where they watch this film of like, this whole movie <coughs> of him, in which she is, um, and then she's gone. But what's left is her shawl. And it's like that object transitions between a world of fantasy and a world of imagination or reimagination. And it's kind of a tactile token, a real object that, that uh, is, um, uh, is, a, is a suggestion of the reality of the, of the memory and its persistence. Now, Tarkovsky used as a kind of refrain in uh, Solaris this chorale prelude, uh, uh, it to be her use of Chris. And uh, it's, it's an amazing use of that piece. It's very sparingly done. And that has a very similar function in this film. It is both uh, a, a kind of dive into the cultural depth of, of the history, but then it's also an effective uh, token that um, is, is, sits right at the the way it's composed, right at the uh, threshold between the trauma and 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 the healing of the wound. Uh, so the piece is um, is um, the middle movement of an oboe concerto by Marcello that uh, Bach arranged for solo piano. And you go on the internet, you find gazillions of people playing this uh, and versions of this. Uh, and I have a personal relationship to it because it was the last piece that I heard in a live concert right before the pandemic <laughs> in an arrangement by the American pianist Earl Wilde. Uh, not him playing, but, but a, a, a former colleague of mine playing it. And I became so obsessed with it that I played it, um, <laughs> memorized it, played it like for about three months until my wife said, I can't stand it anymore. I've got to move on to another piece. So there was this kind of obsessive, there's an obsession about this piece, mm -hmm. in part because it has this incredibly beautiful melody that at moments um, transitions from the minor key to a major key and sort of lifts up. And uh, I'm, I'm getting a little bit more detail about it because I think it relates to the way the piece is possessed and a kind of obsession in this film as a kind of refrain in Deleuze sense. It comes back 
and it carries with this this kind of uh, a message, uh, but it's not so much a message of something that you know, but it's more something that you intuit. It's more affective than emotional. Now, uh, there's another intertextuality here because it's a piece that's also used in Fifty Grades and Shades of Grey. <laughs> As some of you may remember. So there is, an, uh, there is a, a moment of intertextuality here in which one could see if Petzold knew that, which he may, at least the people who, who work with him on the score, it would be an interesting question to ask the director that he might want to rescue it from that kind of more profane <laughs> use of that piece. Um, because this is not just about erotics, I think it's about sublimation. And so a lot of what the film does in terms of, I think, invoking and uh, performing that healing uh, is, is um, using the music in conjunction with the film, as with, with the cinematic, with the story, and uh, with the images as, uh, as a form of sublimation. I like, I like what, what you do with uh, the Deleuzean theme of the ritournelle, right? That, the, the refrain, right? Because I think what Deleuze highlights here is that, yes, it keeps coming back, but there's always something different. Because, because every new move or repetition is a substitute of the preceding move. And I think this is also a motto for this film. That is, in a way, uh, what we see in the film is uh, a partner replacing another partner, but there's always something that remains. And I think that this is also something that we can say about Berlin in the context. That is, you know, the, the, the ghost of the city of the Third Reich is still there. The ghost of the city of the, of the German Democratic Republic is still there, no matter what we do, right? No matter how much we erase, how much we forget, uh, the substitute is not, not always complete. In other words, back to the Deleuzean notion of ritournel, right? Uh, what keeps coming back is not the same, it's, it's the other, right? And I mean, I don't want to get into too much detail about Deleuze's notion no, of ritournel, but it's a dialogue with yeah. Nietzsche, of course, of it's the return of, of the eternal return, return, right? The notion of eternal return. So this, uh, I, I can see other um, connections here to Godard, mm -hmm. who uh, in Allemagne 9-0, um, uses the uh, slow movement on uh, the from the Seventh Symphony, Beethoven's Seventh Sym Symphony. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about that is, similar to the Marcello Bach, is that the piece, even though it is a token or a marker of cultural identity and history, actually leaves that behind mm -hmm. and it becomes aesthetically buoyant. And the buoyancy, I think, works really well with the uh, water imagery here, uh, and to some extent with, uh, with the way it's used, both intertextuality, intertextual, and as an intertextual um, uh, uh, a kind of design feature of intertextuality in Godard. But then it floats from one yes. movie to another, because right. Godard became obsessed with that particular movement, which has a similar kind of melancholic, sort of uh, a shaded, um, an affect, which is neither fully a scherzo or a minuet, but it could also be a slow movement, and that's a similar affect here. So the piece also refuses, or it sheds its associations when it floats from one context mm. to another, mm. and it becomes a kind of autonomous particle, which is one of the things that Deleuze was so interested yes. in with the Ritornel, yeah. that it's not just the Wagnerian, but it becomes purely musical in the way Boulez would then work with, uh, uh, with Wagner. Deleuze has this article about Boulez and, and repetition mm. in, in which this comes out. Mm. I think it's just to sum up, uh, I think one way of thinking about this film, in terms of the Ritornel and a modal structure, is to think about it on a, on a horizontal axis. Mm -hmm. I think you can also think about this film, though, in a, on a vertical axis. And that would be to think of Berlin as a problem test. Mm -hmm. right, that you have one layer of architecture and then it's rebuilt, and yes. then it's rebuilt, and when it's rebuilt. But what is the bottom layer? The bottom mm -hmm. layer is the prehistorical, the bottom layer is the fairy tale, the bottom layer is when it was still a marsh, the bottom layer is, you know, the translation we get in the film, either a marsh or a dry spot in the marsh. 
it is that which is under the bridge. It is that which is under all of the architecture. Mm -hmm. And I may be trying to make this more elegant than it needs to be, but I think one of the hinge points in the film is when, um, when, when Dina says form follows function. Because, in effect, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's at that moment, to get back to Susan's question, mm -hmm. where all the architecture and urban planning connects up directly with love and desire. Because, in effect, I mean, he's, he gets all hot because he's just, you know, instead of saying, talk dirty to me, he's saying, you know, talk architectural history to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I think is so interesting about that is that at the same time, we could say, is this a again, pose the questions, and the questions that one poses to this film are the best ways to open it up, is that Petzold's way of saying, in effect, my use of the water nymph is itself the top layer on another kind of palimpsest. Mm. That there's the palimpsest of the architectural history of Berlin, and the base of that is that which is the prehistoric, the mm. mythological. And then there's another palimpsest, which connects directly to that, which is all of the ways that the water nymph has been used and this is yet another reiteration of that. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to think of this film on a horizontal axis, but I think we can also think about it mm -hmm. in terms of a vertical axis and historicity of both Berlin and the historicity of the water nymph mythology. Does that make sense, Susan? Yes. Yeah, great. Yes. Makes yes. sense. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. We're making <laughs> puzzles are going out the window. Doc? Yeah, it makes sense to me, too, Jim. Uh, the um, uh, the, the film reference that came to mind for me was to uh, Jean Vigo's film, La Talente. La Talente. Mm. And there are some very specific scenes that make me mm. think that he is, in fact, trying to, like, quote that. Mm. So uh, for those who haven't seen this 1932 Could film, yeah. uh, newlyweds have a lover's quarrel. They get separated, and the guy jumps into the... The, the, the river from his barge uh, and he says if you if you hold your breath you can see your love so he's down there under the water mm. with the fish and the weeds and everything and he sees his uh, beautiful bride with her bridal veil and everything floating in the water That's right. That's right. Uh, very similar to a couple of the the scenes here and it, I don't think it's just a visual mm. reference the idea of La Talente is that <clears throat> 1932, it's during the Depression. The social milieu is just horrible, and what survives is, is love, the love of these two people, the eternal romance, you know. And, uh, but there's no hope at all for them at the end of the film. It's like, it, it's like the happiest, de most depressing ending you can imagine. And I think that this is a little like that, that, you know, the, the city of Berlin goes on and on, and it has this uh, eternal return, and it really doesn't matter hmm. what happens to the inhabitants there. And yes, they can have their, their love and, and their uh, visionary experiences, and, but they will come and go. And you have this theme of, um, of animation that runs throughout the film, and repair and, and fixing up, um, and uh, the, you know, the key song there is uh, "Stand Alive, Stand Alive," mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they observe the Hollywood rule of three. <laughs> if you're supposed to pay attention to something, it happens three times, <laughs> like "Stand Alive" <laughs> does in the film. Jeez. That's right. And um, the 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 image that I think uh, sticks out for me is uh, that dam that he was working on, which is this sort of, I don't know. Uh, uh, Ancient, ancient, like 2001: A Space Odyssey monolith of something that was there from another time. Is it from the fascist era? Is it from the 19th century? Uh, and it's always in danger of collapse. He has to go continually repair it, and it's it's life threatening. And uh, the dam and Berlin are like these uh, forces of nature that always mm. are there, waiting to overwhelm individuals mm. and humans. And, but fortunately, we have love. <laughs> I grew up near one of those dams, uh, which was built before the Second World War. And one of the big traumas in the Second World War was the bombing of the Mönetauschberger, mm. which then sent these floodwaters, uh, uh, by the way, also killing a lot of um, uh, forced laborers, unfortunately, mm. uh, downstream at, at the time. Uh, I mean, I think what 
I'm torn between the friend being, I think the friend is more optimistic, because it seems to be rejecting the talking cure. She's just a temp at the museum. And, uh, you know, all the talk about Berlin is just, it doesn't stick. Uh, what sticks, I think, is is uh, the kind of di displaced move to one of those Talschbären, to those uh, uh, artificial dams uh, that still exist. And I completely agree. It's like they, they need attention, they need re repair. But the water is also a very artificial resource there because ultimately they were built in North Rhine-Westphalia where this is uh, was, was shot and that's easily recognizable as a way of powering uh, and regulating water supply for uh, the industrial belt uh, in the Rhineland and Ruhrgebiet downstream because they were dry in the summers and they, they could benefit from uh, when, the, when, when the clouds go up in, in, in eastern Australia and western Australia where I grew up. Yep. So uh, I think that's an interesting, there's an interesting displacement there um, uh, from, from I think what one might call a kind of talking cure to a musical liquidity, fluid, uh, a different kind of cure, a kind of that immersion into water, that kind of cleansing, which of course is part of the original myth. Uh, the original myth is this, um, this embrace uh, through tears and water, uh, or water standing for tears, the death in, 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 in kind of through drowning, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's both, both a death and a form of redemption. That, that is dissociated here. So you have the bad guy killed in the pool, and the other one's, uh, the other one, Christopher's living. Johannes is dying, and Christopher's living. Of course, Johannes is the Baptist, or the Baptist. And Christoph? I don't know. I mean, you know. You could run with that, yes, crosses the water. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. That's, that's great context. Uh, it just occurs to me that. Uh, the, the title of the Vigo film, La Talante, mm -hmm. refers to the barge, the La Talante, but La Talante was in fact another one of these water nymphs who was a very dangerous. Mm. Another reference comes to mind is of course the Night of the Hunter. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I'm still sort of working through this in my mind, but I'm glad you brought up John the Baptist because as I was watching this, to me it had a it had a lot of resonance with the idea of ritual immersion, um, specifically I guess like pre-Christian, maybe in Jewish and also other Eastern um, religions where in order to not create problems like on a spiritual level for a man, a woman who has menstruated has to ritually um, immerse herself. And then through doing that, like if she doesn't ritually immerse, then nothing happens to her because she's already in her body but the spiritual repercussions for the man are, are harsh on a spiritual level, right? If he has sex with her, at, if she has menstruated and not ritually immersed. And I almost saw like this binary between the two men as like men who made different choices, one who like didn't necessarily like recognize, I guess like that, I, like I, I wouldn't even know what to call it, but like purity or impurity power of the woman versus the man who in some ways does respect it. But then I also thought that it had this other layer of, I guess, commentary or lens where it wasn't only just looking at what it did to the man, but what it does to the woman. Because she herself has to choose whether to sacrifice herself or do something like ritually immerse in order to save a man. And I guess like, I would call it a spiritual level because he was technically dead. Um, and this is what I was thinking of as I was watching it, and I don't think that the that it totally tracks, but I also think that it, it does have those resonances, especially when you go to the East and West Berlin, like the male and the female, whatever. That's what was going through my mind. What, what do you think is the way to do? What doesn't fully track? I guess I just, I mean, maybe it's a question of authorial intent. Like, I don't have... I just don't think the filmmaker was thinking that. Like, I wasn't getting that. Like, I think it was just coming from, like, how, like, my personal experience or how I saw it rather than what it was intended to do. I mean, what do you think? Do you think it tracks, or you're like, no, this is off kilter? 
Um, I would not trust the director knowing what he's doing ultimately. <laughs> so, um, I think we own the film. So, um, but I, I'd be interested in, in, in uh, to see whether the film, you know, it's easy to use the binary, it's the wound, the heel, the female, male, the water, land, sort of all the kind of coordinates of uh, of a kind of, of polarity, um, and to see whether there is a third thing there. And I'm tempted to locate it in the music, because the music is, um, the music cannot be tied down one way or the other. It sort of uh, is here and there and nowhere. And um, if you think about the history of the Undina a subject as becoming an opera with Gethe Hoffmann, very successful in 1816, and then in the mid 40s, Albert Lortzing has an Undina a version. Um, it is, um, uh, it has its own life, so to speak, uh, in, in, in a kind of liquidization, becoming liquid in music, and that is much, much harder to pin down. So, uh, I'd like to think that, um, that it takes on a little bit like the buoyancy that I was talking about earlier, but it takes on a life of its own and floats to different contexts. Just to add to that, to get back to the way you described the film, uh, you talked about the choices that she makes. And I think that's something we haven't really talked about yet, but I think it's really important, which is that here we have a water nymph who seems to have a degree of agency uh, that we don't otherwise encounter in a lot of the water nymph, water nymph mythology when it turns up in the various text, where it seems to come as a kind of tragic inevitability. You know, to fall in love and to be fated, and it ends in death, or it ends in finding a soul, or whatever. Here, on the other hand, you know, the film gestures toward that. But on the other hand, she seems to be able to make a lot of decisions about whether she wants to, uh, you know, kill this guy. Yeah, I'm going to kill this guy. Just he, he needs to kill him. Kill him. All right. But then the way, in effect, that she encounters Christoph Christ at the end, there's no sense of, and now you are mine, and I'm going to pull you down. Uh, she chooses to let him go back. And I think. For me, one of the most uh, interesting images in the film is the very last shot, which you know, I think it, it encourages us to wonder, is that her point of view shot? Mm -hmm. As the camera is going underwater. I, mean, I think it, it is, is her point of view shot. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think this is sort of the directorial power. Who tells the story? Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the storyteller, the narrator of the, of the story, which doesn't have to be the director, is basically telling the story and owns the soundtrack as well. So this is real music. And I completely agree with this idea of reading the film as being told not just only from her point of view, but giving her that kind of life-giving, film-creating power. And that can decide who, li who lives and who dies. And in that sense, the film is a goddess of sorts. Is the nymph a goddess? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.